With my kids, I tell them we agree to compromise, which means nobody's happy in the end. Okay? <laughs> compromise is everybody gets a little bit, nobody gets what they want, which means we're all a little happy, but not un we're also all a little unhappy. Go ahead. Okay, I'll just run one thing very quickly. I think one thing to also remember, just think about, and I did some, my master's research partially on this, is the, the notion of sorzhik, which is actually a mixing of Russian and Ukrainian that large swaths of the Russian population speak. And what sorzhik is, it's when, in the Ukrainian context, the uh, people mix Russian and Ukrainian um, at the same time, except it's not like a Creole, which has a very standardized, you know, form of grammar and maybe a vocabulary from another language, it's just constant mixing. You'll hear somebody say thank you in Ukrainian, and the next sentence they'll say thank you in Russian, et cetera, et cetera. And this kind of speaks as a metaphor, I think, for a lot of the, the identity issues that people have had in Ukraine. You know, nobody was forced to really think about it, and the government really failed to get a policy where everybody felt comfortable being part of the Ukrainian state over the last 20 years. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Ukrainian history has been very tragic, and I thank you for initiating this get together. And it would take a lot more of such gatherings to really let people know what has been going on. The problem is uh, geographical. Ukraine has been without any borders on its uh, eastern, northern uh, side. And in the south, you had the, the Tatars. And so initially, Ukraine was an independent country, and it was known as Kiev and Rus even though our professor from U of R says that that was not it. But they had to change their name from Rus into Ukraine because uh, Peter the Great adopted the name Russia. It initially was the Duchy of Muscovy. Throughout Ukrainian history, uh, there was a suppression of Ukrainian language. They wanted to say that we were just little Russians Southern Russians, etc., but not Rusine, which that would be, we would be older than the Muscovy. Kiev Rus was already an established uh, principality, and under Yaroslav the Wise, it already had ties with all European countries. The daughter of Yaroslav the Wise was already signing her name when she was married to Henry of France. So Pine, that history frames your question. Yes, I is. wanted to say that Ukrainian language, nationality, everything was forbidden. So they were between, caught between uh, Eastern, uh, Northeast Russia, in the South, the Turkish Khanate, and the West, Poland. Everybody wanted Ukrainian territory because it was the richest soil in that region. And it was the breadbasket of Ukraine. Now it has become known as the brain basket of Ukraine and also the basket for liberty and freedom. That's what the people stood for at Maidan. They suffered under uh, the Russian Tsarist imperial occupation they suffered under the Polish and Habsburg less. Uh, the Austrian Habsburg Empire treated them more like citizens, and uh, so they were more or less equal with Poland in the Austria Hamby, Hamby, Habsburg Empire. But after World War I, when there was a conference to determine which countries should have the right according to our American President Wilson, which is the country that has the right to be an independent country. Nobody spoke out for Ukraine. They waited and waited in the halls of that uh, conference, and they were never given opportunities to stand up. Same thing happened during World War II. They fought both the Soviets and the Nazi. And in the between, they are getting all kinds of uh, names, fascists, Nazis, etc. When there were more Ukrainians in the Red Army than there were uh, in the other, uh, in, the Nazi, in the German Army. And if you read Timothy Snyder's Bloodlands, you will see all the suffering that took place for Ukrainian nation. And now 
it is a very sad situation because although uh, Putin put an end to the so-called oligarchs who was out of control in uh, Russia, he did not uh, see any need to do that in Ukraine because he didn't want Ukrainians to progress economically. So Yanukovych was a convenient puppet for him. And that is why the people protested because they already knew they could no longer trust anybody. And you should first find out why did the Soviet Union fall apart? It was after Chernobyl nuclear disaster that the people of Ukraine and other republics realized that they were no longer safe in the Kremlin's jurisdiction. And so that's when you had a fall apart of the Baltic states and other Belarus, Kazakhstan, everybody, each republic declared its independence. And now for Crimea, uh, the people who are most in danger there are the Tatars because they already suffered under the uh, Stalin occupation and there were maybe now 200,000, maybe not even that many are left. But Ukrainian territory on eastern southern border was depopulated of Ukrainian native population during Stalin's, during Stalin's uh, famine. And that's when 25% of Ukrainians were starved to death in, at that time. Now, as far as Ukrainian nationalism, it's quite different from the Russian nationalism or any other nationalism. Yes, there were different types of people, but mind you, these were the people who were um, suppressed. They did not have contact with internet. They couldn't look up and see what type of a nationalism was favorable for Ukrainians to really survive as a nation. And this is uh, tragic because right now, uh, again, the same history is being repeated, and people were the most peaceful, loving individuals. They were farmers, and they did not really plan any real attacks against anybody. And this now, you have a better educated population, but has to undergo many stressful life events because uh, uh, Russia itself is a criminal state. The money is all controlled by Mr. Putin and his cohorts. And, they, and the Ukrainian criminals were beholden to the Russians because they were the ones who, who were anointed like uh, the mafia. You will be okay in this region taking care, you take care of that region. And so they were suppressing uh, the ordinary people from achieving ordinary status in life. Yes. Sorry. 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 No, it's okay. Um, <laughs> can I, um, can they, can they, um, we just heard a lecture on history. Can the historian have a moment to reply? Sure. Just give me one second, just to kind of put this in context. Um, so again, I'm kind of straddling two worlds, right? There's like a piece of me that does some like liberal anti-poverty human rights work, but there's a piece of me that's also Ukrainian. And if you haven't noticed, Ukrainian people are very passionate, right? And especially the folks who are living here in the United States. Um, and so some of this is also sort of a sampling about when you talk about the passion of what might be happening, right? So e even though I think there is a, a piece of that Ukrainian history that comes, but that gives you an idea about, about why the folks that see themselves as Ukrainian or maybe Ukrainian nationalistic, why they care so much or where, why this becomes such an impassioned thing. So. I, um, and also, she used to teach me in Ukrainian school, so I couldn't cut her off too quickly. Okay. <laughs> Historian. Actually, I'm not sure that I should reply, but I'm going to attempt to here. Um, what we just heard was uh, precisely an example of the kind of um, version of Ukrainian history as a history of continuous, unending victimization, um, which is um, unfortunately um, not positive. I don't think this is positive in the case of any nation. For a nation to have a history which it views as a history of unexceptioned, uh, unending oppression. 
um, because this gives license to um, act in any way. So there are a lot of problems with what was said. Let me just signal, signal a couple. First of all, um, many states, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, the present Russian Federation, Peter the Great's Muscovy, um, as well as present day Ukraine, have tried to trace their historic, claim their historical heritage traces back to Kiev and Rus. Kiev and Rus was a principality, a loose coalition of towns um, along the Dnieper and other rivers on the Eastern European plain that existed around 1000 CE. Nobody called themselves Ukrainian. The word Ukraine did not exist. They had just converted to orthodoxy. There's not a continuous line of descent from the Kievan state to either Russia, Ukraine, or Poland. Secondly, with regard to language policy, well, it's not the case that the Ukrainian language has always been um, banned under Russian occupation. Um, in fact, under Stalin, um, in an effort to short circuit Ukrainian nationalism, um, the government forced Ukrainian kids to study Ukrainian in school. And in fact, there were Ukrainian protests at this because at the time Russian was the language of the elite and the Ukrainians wanted their children to know Russian. Um, since the topic of the famine has come up, um, the famine was a mass crime against humanity committed by um, Stalin and the people around him in 1932-1933, um, in which they continued to extract grain from villages in Ukraine, as well as in the North Caucasus, as well as in other areas, fertile areas of Russia. Somewhere between five and seven million people died. There is Contest, it is contested whether this was a deliberate attempt at genocide against the Ukrainian people. The number of people who starved to death were predominantly Ukrainian, but the places people starved to death were the places which had the most fertile land, wherever that might be, Ukrainian as well as the North Caucasus. The state was insisting on um, that these areas deliver the most grain and was therefore extracting grain at very high rates from these areas and starved people to death. So with regard to the famine, I would call it mass murder. Um, I would not call it mass murder. I would not call it targeted against Ukrainians in particular. So I'm just gonna get us to another question, but I also wanna talk, make sure we stay focused on understanding what's happening currently in Ukraine. Do you wanna just grab that mic over there? And if folk ha folks have questions while the answers are coming so we can keep it going so we know how many questions are out in the audience, just go ahead and get next to one of these two mics and that'll keep us, that'll cue us to know that there's a bunch of other questions coming. Okay, go ahead, sir. Okay. Um, I would just like to ask a question vis-a-vis -vis the Logan's People's Republic. Um, or actually, the next People's Republic. Um, I believe that it was 1917 that this republic was first formed and it was actually um, shut down by Lenin by the Brest, the Brest Treaty. Um, I'd like to see um, your view on the dynamics between um, Eastern Ukraine being not only distinctly um, against um, Russian imperialism but against uh, um, the domination by the Galician uh, Ukrainians in the West. I would also add you to comment on Nestor Makhno and his uh, anarchist uh, um, <coughs> uh, federations and his um, opposed opposition to being in the sphere of influence of the Galician Ukrainians um, as well. And um, I, this uh, this uh, <laughs> things are turning on, but. Um, the company, a cyberspace company, which um, is currently has permits to drill in Eastern Ukraine and Crimea. It has recently acquired, um, as a board of director, um, Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, um, as a, just as a neutral ethnic voter. I, w I would like to um, see um, how this figures in. Joe, Joe, Biden, Joe Biden has met twice with Poroshenko. Um, how this figures in um, to the military operation against the East, which includes um, shelling populated areas, which is a war crime, as well as shelling by white phosphorus, which infringes on crimes against humanity, of Slavians. Um, just wanted to see your views on this. 
Joe Biden's son, anybody? Crimea oil? Anybody? I'll take it, I suppose, we're not going to go take ours. Uh, I'll, I'll leave the historical part about the Luhansk Republic to the historian here. Although I, I would like to add something to this. Um, I'm, I'm willing to subscribe and partly embrace the theory that nations are imagined communities. As um, uh, United States states used to be the territory of Native Americans and then British colony, what bearing does it have on the national identity of the United States today other than certain historical ties? Um, uh, today, majority of Ukrainians are willing to imagine, very creatively imagine themselves as a nation. Um, they have as rich a cultural and historical claim to it as, as, as anyone. Um, and that is all that matters in addition to, this, to the project of peace. And that project of peace uh, involves the non-renegotiation of borders. Um, and about Joe Biden, um, it would be silly to think that the uh, United States has no dealing, no economic dealings, no political dealings with Ukraine. No nation is an island. They're international specialists. They're, they're, they're even political ties uh, that exist um, you know, between among nations. Um, I've, I've read about these news, um, and my impression is that it pales uh, in comparison to the number of um, Russian citizens that have stakes in various companies and Russian politicians that have stakes in various companies in Ukraine and is it, it's a non-news uh, given its rarity um, uh, and only its rarity is what makes it sensational really because Russians involvement in Ukrainian economy is so vast nobody mentions it anymore at all. Um, I don't have any comments about that specific history. I mean, Nestor Makhna was an, was an anarchist um, part of, uh, leader of some Ukrainian loosely organized peasant militias that were attempting to defend themselves from everybody, the Bolsheviks, the whites. Um, I, I agree with Alena that, um, you know, Ameri there's so little American economic involvement in Ukraine that it's, it's hardly even worth talking about. And, yeah. I, I, so we have a one, one quick side. But it is, what, from the NGO perspective, so to speak, just very quickly. Um, it is interesting, though, that once Russia, uh, Russia kicked the Peace Corps, for example, out in 2002, I believe it was, um, USAID much, much, much later, but they basically shifted all of that money um, to Ukraine, largely. So at one time, for about four or five years, um, for example, Ukraine was the largest uh, recipient of Peace Corps volunteers of any country in the world. Um, so I wouldn't say that we have been uninterested, uh, you know, certainly in Ukraine. Okay, so uh, things are heating up. I'd like to just bring it to the present and the ceasefire that's going on right now, although it's quite strange. But I understand that Obama is telling Putin, well, you have to do your thing and tell these pro-Russian separatists or Russian separatists to stop and stop bringing arms across the border, et cetera. That's what Obama is saying, and Putin is saying, well, Poroshenko, you have to get your military out of the East. And it sounds like, well, I guess my question is, what do you think is gonna happen? <laughs> um, my sense of the situation is that um, it's particularly dangerous because um, for a lot of reasons, I think that Putin does not want an all-out civil war in East Ukraine, and he does not have the military resources to occupy the Ukraine. Um, he was using these separatist forces, and, and, the, and his, well, Russians on the ground from across the border are still supplying them with weapons. Um, I don't think he wants an explosion there, but he may have lost control of the folks that he was using which is very worrisome. So, um, I don't know that he can have a, I don't know that Putin can control whether a ceasefire is obeyed. It's also clear that the central Ukrainian government does not have full control over its own military units or the militias that it has formed. Um, one of the things that's happened that's unfortunate is that 
Because so much of its own military was unreliable, the central Ukrainian government has formed the National Guard, which is drawing heavily from um, the western regions of Ukraine, and particularly from um, paramilitary forces of Svoboda. These folks are going to be seen as foreigners in the east, and they're likely to alienate the eastern population from the central you know, government. In short, I don't think that the central actors have control of the situation anymore, and I think that it's, that is quite dangerous. Just very quickly, um, yeah, I agree uh, that Putin has kind of lost control of, you know, the, especially the, uh, the Russian citizens that have been crossing the borders, that have been, you know, involved in, in whatever you want to call it, uprising, uh, fomenting, whatever, in in Luhansk and, and Donetsk. However, I don't really think he's trying that hard. I do not think that Putin has lost ultimate control. Um, uh, he may not be in the control of every uh, every use of uh, lethal weaponry, but he ultimately has control to stop um, the replenishment of weaponry going to um, to the separatists. So um, I think he has to control to wrap up things fairly uh, fast for um, the separatists, which are outnumbered. Um, really by the forces that are, you know, trying to protect the integrity of Ukraine. So I think it is still up to him, maybe not at the moment to moment, but it is very much up to Russia to bring a peaceful solution to this. And of course it is up to Ukraine to show its willingness to fight and up to the West and the United States in particular to show some respect for international agreements, though they be not full-fledged treaties, but some kind of memoranda. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it's up to the United States to show that they mean something. Uh, hi, first of all, I just wanted to make a small comment. I grew up in Soviet Union, and I grew up in a very western part of Ukraine by the Polish border. And I was forced to learn more Ukrainian, uh, more Russian than Ukrainian. So every day we had two hours of Russian, and every other day we had an hour or two of Ukrainian. So, and that was normal. Um, the kindergartens were primarily Russian. If you wanted the Ukrainian one, it was not so good. The good ones were in Russian language. And I was in a very Western part of Ukraine, uh, the part that is called very nationalistic, you know. And we were forced to communicate in Russian. If you wanted to advance in anything, you had to be part of Communist Party and you were forced to do so. So really, um, it, it, another note I wanna make, I learned history in school. The history I learned in school had nothing to do with the history I hear today, even from uh, the professor from your far. This is not the history we, the Ukrainians, learned during the Soviet times. It was very different. So we were forced on the history that was written by the Soviets, the history that we, the children who are growing up in the proper Soviet Republic, should know as our history, not the true history of Ukraine. So today, we can listen to many presenters and say, okay, this part of history is right, or this part of history is wrong. We really can't say that, because history was rewritten many times over to the convenience of those who occupied our lands. Now, to say that Ukraine is presumably, you know, an imaginary land that was not claimed by anyone, I'm sorry, I am Ukrainian. I am Ukrainian, and I have my country. I live here by choice, and I'm very fortunate to live here. But Ukraine is a country with many, many people. It's the second largest na nation in, a Euro in Europe at the time, I believe. Um, and with that, my question, the original question when I got up, I really wanted to bring the, uh, us to the more current events, and, and I, but the prior um, uh, person did that. I still would like to know, what do you think? How can the world step in? So right now the situation is under not under control by anyone. Putin doesn't really have a control over what is happening in eastern Ukraine, and Ukraine doesn't. Ukraine doesn't have a good military. The military is very, very weak. Uh, they don't have simple things they should have. If you envision American military, this is not what Ukrainian military looks like. They don't have uh, any mm, very basic sense of protecting themselves at nothing. Food is lacking, everything is lacking, weaponry is lacking. So how can the world help to end this? 
How can we have, what can the Europe do, what can US do to help end this? Because it is very dangerous. The situation is dangerous, not just for Ukraine, but if we allow all this to continue in Ukraine, what will happen five years from now, 10 years from now in different region? And this has happened in Georgia before and, and other parts. So how do we deal with this? How do we stop this? What can you ask? Very good question. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think in some way, shape or form, uh, whether we want to admit it or not, Russia is definitely going to be part of some kind of solution. Um, and I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't really feel like this conflict just started you know, this year. I mean, it's been flaring up. We, I have not heard one mention of 2004 in this room tonight at all. You know, which was a revolution that you know Yanukovych won, and then it went to the courts, and you know they did a revote and brought uh, Yushchenko to power. Um, but this has been, this has been, it's. There's been a lot of turmoil, and, 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 and it's been a very alive problem, I feel like, for, for a long time, especially since 1991. Um, and uh, I think the best thing you know we can hope for is a peaceful settlement. But I, I feel like it's going to, as much as I don't want to admit it, um, I think at some level, I hope it doesn't just slip into a frozen type conflict, which I think Putin definitely thought about. Uh, you know, several months ago when he was thinking about, well, we just do what we did, you know, to the several provinces in Georgia, for example. Um, you know, they're not really states, they're just kind of in between, but therefore, you know, you cannot join certain <laughs> international organizations if your country has territorial disputes. And I think that's initially what he was thinking. What he's thinking today, I have less uh, clear idea about, but certainly that's still part of his thinking, I think. Um. Uh, I, I certainly would not want to make um, helping Ukraine seem like an easy task. Dealing with an authoritarian, nuclear, oil and gas rich nation is no easy task for the global economy, especially for Europe that is so dependent on that gas, oil, as well as for the United States and other nations that are dependent on some sort of Russian goodwill in some other projects in the world. Um, however, Europe and the West must stand strong. Um, I think the current tactics are correct but insufficient. Sanctions ought to be ramped up. Uh, pressure of exclusion and isolation needs to be ticked up, although I don't think, uh, I do think that uh, care in diplomatic and such relations is, is key. In a longer perspective, I think energy independence for Europe is a very effective lever and solution, the aim of energy independence uh, there. And more generally, um, I would agree and echo, um, I think, Joe's statement earlier, um, that the West ought to have perhaps a wiser, deeper, more fundamentally coherent problem policy towards reversing, lessening, managing growing authoritarianism in Russia. Russia is too big to ignore um, and it's too dangerous to simply leave in its current state. So that's a much longer term solution. Currently, um, I think the US should push Europe for further sanctions, should supply more and better non-lethal help to the Ukrainian army. Um, I, not qualified to talk or recommend um, military aid. That's not the issue I'm comfortable with commenting on, but I think more of what US is doing, a more firm um, insistence on protection of territorial integrity of Ukraine as guaranteed in the Budapest memo, including the Crimea. I appreciate Elena's comments uh, about um, the uh, reasons for why there is uh, sort of a set of that some of the people in eastern Ukraine might be interested in um, kind of uh, rising up. Uh, part of what you said was about um, sort of the very poor economic conditions in those regions, and I think Joe was kind of alluding also to the recent history since 1991. Uh, with the dissolution, dissolution of the Soviet Union, um, 
And I, in these discussions, I have not really heard much about that recent history and sort of the process that the post-Soviet region went through uh, over the last 20 years, um, and specifically the economic policies that created tremendous inequality in Russia, in Ukraine, uh, the shock therapy that occurred. Uh, I'm also sort of interested in the Western uh, uh, advancement of those policies, the consultants that flew in, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, the policies that were that pursued uh, that were pursued that created inequality that, um, in, in my opinion, um, really took away a lot of power from the population and are possibly contributing to some of the uh, elite rising up and you know having these. Uh, uh, territorial dispute. So, uh, if you could address some of the recent history and the economic policies uh, in the region, that'd be great. So, um, I think that long term, um, the so called shock therapy policies did not have um, particular, particularly strong effect. I think that in both Ukraine and Russia, um, what mattered initially was the privatization process. Um, in which um, actors who were, you know, had good connections, party connections or otherwise, were able to grab disproportionate shares of the property. Of property. Since then, um, I guess you could. The Russian under Putin, Russian economic policy has been state-led, and um, there is an, an immense gap, as you suggest, between the very wealthy and the poor. It's a it's a gap similar to that growing worldwide. It is um, nonetheless the fact that, relatively speaking, Russia has been doing well economically. Um, Ukraine, um, because the, probably because the central government is weaker and also because they do not have as expensive energy resources to sell, has not been doing as well. So one of the differences, one of the things going on one of the possible pulls for East Ukrainians to join Russia, as we've seen, a majority don't want to, is the fact that standards of living, standards of living are actually higher across the border. I guess that the short answer to your question is that I don't see the, the Western shock therapy episode as being particularly important in terms of creating um, inequality. Um, Joe, do you want to say something? I would just say, though, I would just add that, uh, you know, I think it's important to remember, you know, in, in terms of your average Russian, uh, thinking about the Russian situation, why, you know, they are, um, and the Russian state, et cetera, et cetera very st uh, skeptical of you know, color revolutions for that part of the world, as well as, you know, stuff like the Arab Spring, um, and, and, and stability, and why it was, I was just shocked with how everybody on March 1st was totally for, you know, the takeover of Crimea. Um, you know, from like, you know, pot smoking, long haired hippie musicians to, uh, you know, university administrators to the average person on the street. And I think that the, the history of, you know, having to deal with that instability in the 1990s kind of plays a very large role in informing that and the, the, the desire to force stability. Yes, um, I had a question about um, back to the situation, the current situation in um, East Ukraine. And um, it kind of struck me the comment of comparing uh, the Ukrainian military to the American military because my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the Ukrainian uh, military is um, conducting airstrikes on civilian areas in East Ukraine. Whereas the United States military, no matter how many resources they have, are not allowed to operate within the boundaries of this country, period. And um, I think this is something really hard fought in this country. This is a really important aspect of the American freedom. So I, I'm wondering like, if I could you know, understand like, what your response is, uh, realizing that there is uh, something not good going on in East Ukraine and, for ha and that the uh, central government is feel threatened and upset about it, but would there have been, like if, if their, say, uh, friends in the international community had, instead of supporting a military solution to that problem, uh, might perhaps be more assertive about supporting a, uh, a negotiated solution where 
uh, you know, there would be some kind of understanding, uh, it might be a better solution. So I just wondered if I could get some feedback on that perspective. Thank you. Um, so first of all, there, to my knowledge, no documented cases of Ukrainian army shelling, bombing, or shooting at civilian, uh, uh, civilian territory, civilian objects. And that is actually one of the reasons why Ukrainian army cannot, for many, many weeks, make decisive inroads into the few, really, the few cities and, and, and villages that are uh, occupied by separatists because they cannot and they will not shoot at civilian targets. Where separatists have positioned them, themselves very conveniently at the upper floors of tall buildings, in kindergartens, in hospitals. I mean, the cynicism of this is so overwhelming. It is unreal, but we've seen the statistics before. So that's one thing. Um, secondly, I'm not a historian, but I believe uh, United States Army certainly used firepower in defense of its territory when its territory was attacked. Pearl Harbor and Hawaii is an example that I think we can all agree on. That there is no law on uh, a, a ban on the use of lethal force in defense of the territory of the United States. Um, it is that United States has been incredibly lucky to have the geographical position few enemies, overwhelming force, and you know, sort of being away from the good old Europe, uh, you know, ridden with many different nations and therefore many conflicts. But once again, the reports of Ukrainian army, including National Guard, shooting <coughs> civilians are absolutely untrue to my bestest of knowledge. And believe me, I even read as far as my patient allows, Russian sites, and I try to compare, and I view videos, and I read way too many hours about these subjects, and that is absolutely my best opinion. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you said that, and uh, that's, it's, that's good information. I do want to say one thing about the American military, though. Since the Civil War, the American military is not, um, you know, it is, there's a rule called posse comitatus, and when the United States defended against Pearl Harbor, they went and attacked Japan. They didn't um, come back and attack people on the continental US. But that's separate, because you're saying that's not happening in Ukraine either, which is great news. Thank you. Um, as, Aliana, as Aliana says, the, um, the separatists are using, um, effectively using the population as human shields. And um, this has been an obstacle to the Ukrainian military and they behave with a fair degree of restraint. Um, there have been, it, it's very hard to determine um, the details of violence on the ground and the stories um, that develop about that violence are then, can then lead to escalation. It's a terrible situation. Um, there were a couple of incidents um, in Odessa in Mariupol where buildings occupied by Russian separatists who had been violent were burned down and in some cases, separatists were prevented from leaving the building, so they were effectively burned to death. Um, the incident in Odessa has been, and I'm not, I'm not saying whether I buy this or not, but the incident in Odessa has been ascribed to um, a National Guard militia. Um, so um, that's just to add a little bit more. Now, as far as the United States using deadly force against its own population, the Army may not do it, but we have SWAT teams that use effectively use um, heavy, heavy weaponry against our own population, so I don't know that we can be particularly proud of our own record. Okay, so we've got about 10 minutes, we'll call it seven, two more questions. Uh -huh. Okay. Quickie, which media sources do you trust? Well, you know, you shouldn't trust anything completely, but you have to make choices as to what you read. Um, um, obviously, uh, I read a lot of Ukrainian Russian language sources, so that will be helpful to you. Um, but Kiev Post is a leading uh, Ukrainian uh, English language newspaper, kievpost.com. Uh, so uh, it provides much more detailed news than you, you would find here. Um, 
there are summaries of news in English that are provided on Ukrainian Pravda newspaper, which is pravda.com.ua. Um, those would be the sources that I would recommend that would bring you those news. BBC Ukrainian can be recommended, and its coverage does not differ in details from the two sources that I mentioned before, but again provides at least a non-US uh, reporting. Um. Yeah, I think that um, the sources Alona, Aliana suggests are, are good. Um, I've been reading Ukrainian and Russian language. BBC is good. Um, I don't. I wouldn't trust the New York Times particularly. Um, they are. They are um, really um, providing uh, a straight up U.S. government line. Um, if you want a a perspective put out by the Russian central government, there's RT.com which is an interesting mix of, of sort of grossly obvious propaganda and some pretty interesting reporting. And I'm sure you're intelligent enough to sort out what's what. I think I, think I would just, yeah, I agree absolutely with the New York Times. I mean, it's been progressively going in that direction for the last five to 10 years. But uh, I guess I would only add uh, something, a, a rung below RT would be uh, Russia Behind the Headlines, rbth.com. Um, it is Kremlin funded, but at the same time, there's a little bit more variety of opinion in there. So they've, they've had a few articles. They've had some tr atrocious articles. But they've also had a few that are really good. It's really hit and miss. Let me add one more source. There's a resource called Brahma.com, and it actually collects um, uh, sort of the headlines about Ukraine. And it used to be a blessed time. Well, it seems blessed now, although you know, quiet times are not always the best times anyway, where those were so few that they could give you, you know, 20 headlines for a day. These days I think they're overwhelmed and there's so many headlines on Ukraine, I, I don't even know what they're going to do. But Brahma.com news and media section collects headlines from a variety of sources from Radio Free Europe to BBC to Washington Post to just Yahoo and Reuters and just everybody else, just a kind of a big mishmash, but a quick and easy cut to headlines on Ukraine. Another one to add to that is johnsonslist.org, right? Is it do .org or .com? Johnson's List, um, it's a, very similar. It's, it's the top 10 uh, stories of the day about Russia, but of course right now I'm pretty sure about half of them will, will deal with Ukraine. And surprisingly, Moscow Times, it's an English language newspaper that's been in Moscow since 91, 92, 93. I thought it just like completely lost its way in the last year has had pretty decent coverage a la uh, Kiev Post. Okay, one, oh, Fred? Sorry, I have a question. Yes, I, I was gonna say one last question. Oh, well, you mentioned the New York Times is sort of a mouthpiece for the, uh, for the American uh, perspective. And I wonder if any of you could talk about, well, what is the rationale behind the American perspective and is it counterproductive to any possible settlement of these, you know, of the issues in Ukraine. Because all I see, and one of the reasons we held this forum was because all we were reading yeah. was Putin bashing, Russia, Russia hardline. What is the rationale there, and, and how can that possibly be helpful? Um, you're asking the rationale for U.S. government policies, um, and this um, enables me to follow up on a question that was asked earlier. Um, what do we do now? I think U.S. government policy, um, we don't have military options. We simply don't. Um, Obama's, the sanctions that have been put in place are actually bite a bit more than is um, popularly understood. Um, a political scientist and at a previous Ukraine forum, a poli-sci guy from U of R explained this to me. Um, when they sanction a particular person, any um, corporations in which that person owns a certain percentage of assets are also sanctioned. So some of these people that have been sanctioned, the sanctions are actually hitting banks, some, uh, some important Russian banks fairly hard. I think in the terms of the larger question of what we need to do, which has been asked, um, I think that um, we need stronger sanctions and the Europeans have to get on board, and it's going to be very hard to do that because of German investment in, in Russia and the, 
the Germans don't want to do this. And in particular, what would really fight would be a boycott of um, Russian natural gas imports and energy independence, as uh, I believe all our nations do with European energy independence. Um, and I also think that in terms of understanding the Russian point of view, NATO would have to be, Ukrainian membership in NATO would have to be taken off the table. And I think that if you combine those two things, you might get a solution. I know it may be surprising to uh, folks on the left that anything in American foreign policy may be on the right track, but this, I think, may be the case. Um, I think American policy to date is uh, fairly wise in its care, um, but I think the biggest risk is that the policy will be dropped, that Ukraine will disappear from the headlines, that other issues like Iraq would take over and the policy would not be consistently applied for as long as it takes. So I generally think they're not, um, you know, have a positive view of current uh, U.S. policy on Ukraine. I just fear that it might not be upheld long enough for it to take effect. Um, just one sentence, I guess. Yeah, I mean, some kind of, uh, some kind of compromise a la you know, taking NATO off the table, which have been discussed and promised uh, to Russia you know, on several occasions by uh, high leaders uh, in, you know, in the 2000s. You know, Ukraine will not be, don't worry, they're not going to join NATO. Uh, I think it needs probably to take it off to begin to work towards something looking like a permanent solution. But yeah, there's all sorts of other options. It's amazing. Even, yeah, back to the sanctions as well. It's hitting even some, there was, I heard the, 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 the pop singer was not a US visa because they had financial connections to somebody that was on the sanctions list. So it's really much more widespread than, you know, than we imagine. I do want to address the question of NATO. Um, I don't think it would be uh, politically proper, legitimate, or otherwise to promise Russia that Ukraine will never be part of NATO. Um, that is a politically rotten precedent to do so. Small nations, smaller nations, neighbors of aggressors seek collective security to promise another aggressive nation that its weaker neighbor may never petition to join uh, an organization of collective security is, um, is a betrayal of all sorts of ideals of peace um, that I think United Nations and people of goodwill everywhere really hold dear. So to promise that s a nation will be denied collective security and protection of other nation in the case of open aggression of its neighbor is not anything I would recommend the US or the West to do. It would set a very dangerous precedent. It would just be a rotten signal to the entire international community. Okay. Here's the thing. The, the natives are going to get restless. One word. Finland. I said one word. I one word. Hi, hey, folks. Uh, as I said, we have to depart this this room at nine o'clock. I want to thank the panelists and Lisa for and for all of you. We clearly could go on for quite a while, and we just touched the touched the surface. But thank you all.